Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm Teresa. I'm one of the physical therapists for the Center for Neurorehabilitation at Boston University. And we are so excited today for another episode of Let's Keep Moving with the APDA. I know everyone is just having a chance to come on and sign up. Um, if you have a chance to say hello in the chat, let us know where you're from and how you're doing. Of course, we'd love that. Um, it's so nice to see Sherry uh, from Portland. We have so many people from across the country. Um, thanks, Eloise. It's great to see everybody here. So we want to welcome everyone, give everyone a chance to sign on. Um, and I, I will get started with a little bit of an a introduction. Um, this is a welcome for everyone to our latest episode of Let's Keep Moving with the APDA. Uh, for those of you who have been turning into these webinars, um, you have seen that our latest series is meant to show how some of our colleagues in your healthcare team can help stay active, uh, help you stay active in the, your community. Last month in March, Tim had a great interview with Lisa Summers, uh, who's a professor and a clinic director for the Center for Language, Speech, and Hearing at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And they dis discussed how speech language therapy can help address speech and communication issues that can improve lifestyle and help people participate in daily activities. Um, and then in February, Tammy had a wonderful interview uh, with Rachel Reynolds, who is a dietitian who also works at Boston University uh, Sergeant Choice Nutrition Center. They had a great discussion on how proper nutrition can help support an active lifestyle. Uh, and if you weren't able to see these talks, we definitely recommend watching the recording. They're available on the APDA website and also on social media. But today, we are so lucky to have Maura O'Keefe joining us. Maura is an occupational therapist at the Spalding Outpatient Center in Medford, Massachusetts, and she's experienced uh, in working with people who have neurological conditions, including Parkinson's disease. Um, and as many of you know, Parkinson's disease can affect someone's ability to participate in many typical daily activities. So we're especially thrilled to have Maura here today joining us for this important topic. As physical therapists, we often work with people uh, to engage in a healthy lifestyle, engage in lifestyle changes, or in some cases, maintaining an active lifestyle by encouraging people to keep up with activities that are important to them. But we see how difficult some daily activities can be, and that can lead to people having a less active lifestyle. So today, we're hoping to discuss some of the areas that people often report having difficulty, and more importantly, talk about how occupational therapy may be able to address that and give strategies to help everyone be as active and as healthy as they would like to be. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn things over to Maura. Hi, Teresa. Thank you. And thank you for that very lovely introduction, and thank you to uh, Boston University and the APDA for the invitation to come and speak with you all today. Um, happy and excited to share with you um, some ideas about what occupational therapy can do to help those who are living with Parkinson's disease. Um, and I want to begin first by explaining just very briefly for those who may not be familiar with occupational therapy or are hearing about it for the first time today, what it is we do as a profession. So the primary goal with which um, Teresa alluded to uh, of the occupational therapist is to enable the person to participate in their everyday activities. Um, so looking at my graphic here, um, you can begin to think about all of the ways that we move through our day and all of the activities that we have to perform. So that may begin with our basic self-care activities like dressing ourselves and bathing ourselves and eating, um, to moving within our home to perform uh, our housework or to prepare our meals and then moving beyond our home into our communities to um, go to work, to socialize with friends, to meet with family um, and being able to do all of those things safely and moving efficiently. And that's our goal to help you to keep doing that. Um, and we want to encourage people to do the things that they need to do, um, that they want to do and that they're expected to do. Um, and there are many different ways that we can accomplish this. So sometimes it's helping an individual acquire a new skill in order to maintain their independence with their daily activities. 
Other times we'll work on remediating skills that may be diminished due to uh, disease or illness or injury. Sometimes we'll modify the way a task is performed. So we'll help you to continue to perform that task independently, but maybe doing it in a slightly different way. And then other ways that we help individuals to maintain their independence is by suggestion, excuse me, suggesting modifications for their environment. So perhaps adding a tool or a piece of equipment that helps you to continue to move and be safe while you're performing those daily activities. And so as we begin to think about Parkinson's disease and some of the typical symptoms that we see with PD, we can begin to understand how these symptoms can impact one's performance during their daily activities. Um, so thinking about some of the common symptoms such as bradykinesia, tremor, um, imbalance, fear of falling, rigidity, and fatigue, um, we can begin to understand how these symptoms impact the quality of our movements when we're performing our daily activities, such as sipping a cup of coffee or typing at our computer. And the symptoms may impact the efficiency of the movement, or they may compromise the individual's safety when they're performing that movement, or they may even cause pain when that patient is moving to perform their daily activities. And sometimes, the unfortunate outcome, which we don't want, is that the individual begins to withdraw from their daily activities, or they begin to compromise one activity for another. So they can do things like their simple self-care, but then they're left with um, limited energy or limited ability to move through the things maybe that they really want to do, like meeting a friend uh, for a walk in the neighborhood or going out to walk their dog. And so that that's where we come in. We really try to prevent the the withdrawal from those roles, restricting participation in that, those activities in order to maintain independence and to really achieve a high level of participation in daily activities with ultimately the goal of maintaining a really good quality of life. So, so let, me, let me ask you, when is, when it, appropriate is it appropriate for someone to be referred to OT? Uh -huh. Yeah, so certainly, Teresa, anytime anyone is experiencing some of the symptoms uh, associated with Parkinson's that are beginning to impact their performance of their daily activities, that would be an appropriate time to come to OT. Or if they begin to notice that their safety is compromised, maybe they're continuing to do their daily activities um, independently, but they're feeling less safe when they're performing them. Certainly, that's an appropriate time to come on in and see us. Um, but more and more, we're learning that it's valuable to, to refer to occupational therapy, as well as our other rehab specialties early on to pursue proactive treatment. Um, and traditionally, patients were often referred to us in the later stages of, of Parkinson's disease when we were really seeing more profound occupational dysfunction. But the evidence is showing us that more and more patients are benefiting early on so that we can be really proactive in, um, in that treatment. And so the shift in the delivery model um, is beginning to happen, which is great. We're starting to see patients more uh, earlier on in the disease where we can really begin to help them retain participation in those goals that they can continue to move efficiently throughout their day. Um, the other benefit of early referral is to establish a, a nice rapport with your therapy teams, with somebody who can follow you perhaps th through the progression of your rehab course. Um, and it also helps your rehab team um, understand sort of your baseline functional status, which is very beneficial. Um, an important thing to know is that the American Academy of Neurology does have quality indicators that state that your neurologist or your movement disorder specialist should be having this conversation with you on an annual basis, uh, talking about what the possible benefits of rehab could be. Um, so if you haven't started to have those conversations yet with your neurologist, feel empowered to bring that up during your next appointment and have that open conversation about things that really might be starting to change and can therapy be effective for me at this point. Um, the other point that I want to make is when you do finally seek a referral to any of your therapies, think about trying to uh, find a center or a therapist who does have experience working with 
with individuals with Parkinson's disease. PD really has a very unique set of um, motor and non-motor symptoms that can impact the quality of your movements when you're performing your daily activities. So having or working with somebody who really understands what those symptoms can be um, and how those can be impacting you from day to day can be beneficial. Um, so I, I encourage you to talk to your neurologist to help you locate a neuro rehabilitation center in your area. Ask those questions. Does your team have experience working with people with Parkinson's disease? If you're still having trouble finding somebody, think about contacting Boston University's hotline. We'll share that information with you at the end uh, of this presentation. Um, they may be able to help you with um, connecting with somebody in your community. And of course, the APDA Center for Advanced Research, they may be able to connect you with local facilities that can um, put you in touch with individuals or, excuse me, therapists who have experience working with individuals with PD. Sure, thank you. That's great. I'll make sure, I'll make sure that everyone's able to see the phone number and the email address uh, to contact if they need any help with an OT referral at the end of this talk today. Great. Um, so I thought, Teresa, we might move on to, to what are some of the things that we begin to work on in occupational therapy when we first begin to see a patient in the early stages of Parkinson's disease. As I said earlier, um, we really think it's beneficial for people to begin the rehab process early. And often in those early stages, a great deal of what we do is focused on patient education and training and trying to incorporate caregivers, loved ones, family members into that training as much as possible, because we know that improves the carryover into your home, into your community, and it helps you to be consistent with the things that we're training in therapy. Um, there are many, many topics that your occupational therapist will probably begin to discuss with you as you begin therapy, but two of them that I wanted to highlight today are pacing and energy conservation, as well as self-management of motor symptoms, because these are really sort of the two that I kind of address very quickly when we begin therapy, and they're so important to help um, our patients continue to move and move well when they're doing their daily activities. Um, the other point that I want to make is that um, now that COVID restrictions are beginning to be lifted, uh, many hospital centers and uh, medical offices are beginning to allow visitors to participate in medical appointments and therapy appointments. So do ask that question if a family member or a caregiver can come to you to therapy, because I think, as I said before, it is great when another person is hearing the information. It just helps us to remember and carry over those strategies when we go home. Um, so pacing and energy conservation is a technique that's used to modify, adapt, or schedule your daily activities in a way that you can continue to have energy throughout the day to not only perform the activities that you have to do, like personal hygiene, but the things that you really want to do. So saving the energy for the things that are really important for you, um, such as going for a bike ride or um, after work or being able to meet up with friends. Um, so on my slide here, I have an, a, a sample of an activity and a fatigue log. And this is sort of one of the first things that I'll begin to do um, with my patients because I wanna begin to learn how they're spending their day and how they're spending their energy. And fatigue is often one of those non-motor symptoms that individuals with Parkinson's disease will begin to report. And unfortunately, about a third of individuals with PD will often complain that fatigue is their most bothersome symptom. So how do we manage that fa fatigue and, and continue to move throughout the day? Um, so I always begin with an activity and a fatigue log, and I ask my patients to track their activities throughout the day and do this for a sample of days that are typical for you. So not a week when family's visiting out of, from out of town and you're just exhausted, or not a week when you're on vacation from work, but really during a, a, a span of time when you're really kind of doing your normal daily routine. And um, what you'll do is record your activities, how long it took you to do those activities, and what your fatigue level was on a scale of zero to 10 after you have completed those activities. And then in addition to that, adding in the times that you took your medications. Um, and once we've 
collected that data over a few days or a week's time, we begin to look at that data and see if we can identify any patterns or activities that are really provoking in terms of fatigue. Or um, also we begin to look at, are there times when the quality of the performance of the daily activities relative to the timing of your medication dose is, is affected. Um, so thinking about, am I taking my medication at the right time so that I can be moving well during the times when I have to be moving the most? Um, and so after we've looked at that information, what do we do? How do we fix this? How do I make sure that I have all of the energy that I need to do everything I need to do? So the very first thing is, is assessing your values and your goals. What are the things that are really important to you? What are those things that you really want to continue to do independently um, and that you really wanna move well to do? Um, and then from there, we can begin to think about how can I modify or maybe simplify this task so that I'm not spending all of my energy on this one task and I can really do everything that I wanna do throughout the day. So simple changes that we think about are maybe modifying your position when you're doing a task. So if you do all of your morning routine while you're standing up, maybe you take part of that time to sit down so that you're conserving energy to walk the dog after you've finished your morning routine and, and that you feel well while you're doing that and you're moving well while you're doing that. Um, simplifying tasks, a simple example would be um, if you're spending 30 minutes prepping all of the vegetables and ingredients for your dinner, but then you're too exhausted to eat, then maybe buying some pre-chopped vegetables um, and, and saving that energy so you can enjoy and interact during your meal if that's what you really value. Um, the next thing we think about is the timing of your medication, and this is so important. And this is uh, a point where we really collaborate with your physicians to say, hey, we, we looked at this data, we examined this information from their activity log. It doesn't seem like the timing of their dose really matched, their, their medication doses really matches when they need to be moving the most efficiently. Is there some flexibility in, in the timing of their medication so we can really, really um, get them moving well when they need to move well? Um, the next point, which is resting proactively, is, is another one that I really try to emphasize. It's not one that we think about often, um, Often our bodies tell us to rest when we're already fatigued. And so using that information from our activity log, we can say, I know by 11 o'clock, for example, I'm really tired at that point. But then taking a step back from that and saying, I'm going to rest earlier than that. I'm going to rest so I prevent that point where I'm reaching total exhaustion. And then I do have enough energy to go on and perform the rest of my activities this day. Um, getting regular exercise. I know this is a point that that has been emphasized in our earlier webinars and is so, so important. And it doesn't really seem inherent for, for a lot of us that if we exercise, we're going to have more energy. But Teresa, I'm sure you can validate this, right? Um, we know that individuals who exercise on a regular basis tend to report less fatigue. They have more energy to do all of the things that they want to do. Um, the other really important thing is that um, exercise primes our body for sleep. We also know that those who exercise regularly tend to sleep better. And when we sleep better, we're less fatigued. And when we're less fatigued, we can move better the next day. So regular exercise, good sleep gonna, is going to help our bodies move and help us to stay independent with our daily activities. And then the other thing we have to think about are, are there other sources of fatigue that we, we haven't considered other than the Parkinson's disease? So um, sleep hygiene is a good one um, that we need to talk about a lot. Um, are we getting proper sleep at night? Are there side effects perhaps of other medications that we might be taking that can be sedating or interfering with our performance of our daily activities? Are there emotional or mental health issues such as depression or anxiety that are, are causing us to feel more fatigued and how do we address them with our other care providers? So those are important conversations that we have early on. Um, and now I wanted to move on to self-management of motor symptoms. So, so now that I have enough energy to do what I wanna do, how do I move well when I'm doing what I'm doing? Um, 
And how do I get the best quality of movement during my daily activities? And um, some of the management strategies that I'm going to talk about here really kind of be applied to many of your daily activities. But I wanted to focus on handwriting since it's one of the common complaints we hear from individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, how can I continue to move well when I'm doing this activity? Um, one of the concepts for self-managing motor symptoms that we educate our patients on is really bringing focused attention to the activity that you're performing. Um, and that can be done in a variety of ways. The first thing I say is try to reduce distractions in the environment. So if you're sitting down, if we're gonna use the example of handwriting, if you're gonna sit down and write a thank you note, for example, turn the TV off, uh, limit conversations with other people in the room, um, you know, turn the radio off and really just focus on your writing. Um, and then think about how do you want to move? And so micrographia, which is, um, you know, this progressive decline in the size of our handwriting um, is often what affects individuals with Parkinson's disease. So we want our handwriting to be big. So that's the the cue, the reminder that you're going to give yourself is, I'm going to write big, big, big. Also, when it comes to handwriting and often with other activities, slowing down the movement a little bit helps us to achieve those big movements. So you might be telling yourself big and slow or big and smooth so that your letters are written smoothly. And again, these are concepts that we can apply to other daily activities as well. Um, we can also rely on visual reminders in our environment. So for writing, that might mean using lined paper. And I always encourage my individuals with PD, try to write on lined paper because that line is just that reminder that my letters have to be as tall as that line. So bringing your pen all the way up to the top of the line and using that as a visual cue. Um, and then lastly, thinking about just stopping and resetting your movements. So um, especially in, 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 with issues with micrographia, just setting the pen down and then picking it back up and resetting can really help um, with improving the quality of the handwriting there. So little, little strategies that can be used to help improve the movement. Um, but as I said, it can, be, it can be used across many different activities. <laughs> And then here on my last slide are just some, some kind of big categories, dressing, eating, and computer work. Um, these tend to be the areas of daily activities that, that um, we address very often in occupational therapy and, and that we get a lot of questions about. I'm noticing changes here. What are some things that can help me? In addition to the educational strategies we go over, these are just some, some products, some tools, some tips that could be helpful. Uh, in day-to-day -day life. And I should say that I don't have any affiliations with any of these companies, um, but they, they, I think a lot of these um, tools grew, grew from a need. There are so many creative people out there and they, they have offered wonderful solutions for, for some of the issues that, that um, we face every day with our daily activities. Do you have any questions about these, Teresa? Maybe I can explain some of them. More I do. Um, it, there's some I, I'm familiar with and some I've not heard of before. Um, okay. a, a little bit curious about the computer work, the, the steady oh, mouse. Yes. Do you have a way to explain that? Or Sure. So steady mouse is a software that you can install on your computer. So for those of us who use a mouse when, when we're um, using the computer, issues is control of the mouse. So we see the pointer kind of moving all over the the, our screen and steady mouse really stabilizes the pointer. So um, through the magic of this software, it really dulls the, the unwanted movements and learns the direction that you wanna be moving in. So it's, it's a wonderful software. It, it helps people to remain engaged with their computer work along with um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, which I think more people are familiar with. It's voice to text software. So if keyboarding and mouse more difficult, or if it's just becoming fatiguing, um, relying on other sources like your voice can be helpful in being able to engage with your computer work. Um, I also wanted to just take a minute to, to talk a little bit about the dressing tools because there are so many on the market now, many retailers, I shouldn't say many, but a few retailers are really beginning to target 
um, consumers who, who have different needs. So Zappos, which is an online retailer, has a whole adaptive line of clothing that use things like magnets and Velcro Velcro closures for individuals who may have difficulty with coordination. Tommy Phil Hilfiger also has an adaptive line. And um, there are other devices like magnets, like in Zubits and MagZip, which use magnetic closures to close things like your shoelaces or your zippers. Um, so what I tell people is that if you are having a problem, Google it because somebody else has had that problem and somebody has probably created a solution for you, which we see here. And there are many of them. This is just a small sample of, of some tools that I have found to be really, really helpful um, for our individuals with PD. Maura, this is excellent. And I might have us stay with that, that slide just for a moment. Um, sure. I, well, thank you so much for all of this information. Um, and one of the questions that's come into us in the chat is from Stephen and uh, I'll ask the question, then I might take the physical therapy answer first uh, and pass okay. it to you. <laughs> Stephen says, what's the difference between an occupational therapist and a physical therapist? And I think kind of having this slide up as a framework gives mm. gives some um, some answer to that. I would say in physical therapy, um, very curious to work with someone related to their balance, their walking, uh, their overall exercise program, and different avenues of strength and conditioning. Um, perhaps. And I think um, if you had to take that same question, the difference between mm -hmm. occupational therapy and physical therapy, I'm just curious mm -hmm. what you would add to that. Yeah, so that's a really good question that comes to us often. So um, in, in occupational therapy, we certainly consider all of the things that Teresa just mentioned. So balance, endurance, strength. And we think about those um, those areas and we have to consider them when you're performing your daily activities. So if you have limited strength, then perhaps it may be difficult to stand up in the shower. And so we think about uh, working on perhaps maximizing your strength so you can ultimately stand in the shower. Or perhaps we think about how can we modify that activity so that you can maintain your independence with all of your self-care activities, all of your daily activities. So we consider all of the things that you're working on in PT and then we we translate those into daily life. How do we maintain our independence with our daily activities? I hope that I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I may have us go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a question from Alice. Uh, and maybe back up just a little bit. Uh, Alice says, uh, "I'm living in a place where there's few, very few qualified people to help uh, mm -hmm. those with Parkinson's. What can I do?" And Alice, from this point of view, and I think I think Maura addressed this um, so nicely as well, is at the uh, APDA Exercise Helpline, we would love to be able to help uh, if we could. If you have a chance to give us a call or email at rehab at bu.edu, we, we would certainly love to take a look at what resources we can find in the area where you live. But Maura's point is well made about talking to your movement disorder specialist, your neurologist, to see who they might recommend that they know locally. Um, so I think that's a, another question that's come to us. Uh, Maura, there's there's another question. Maybe we mm -hmm. kind of have a kind of a joint answer. A question yeah. uh, from the audience about how do I know if I need OT and PT or just one of those? Mm -hmm. um, and if I were to take a shot at it, I, <laughs> I loved your point about I think both are so helpful. And to have an established relationship with the mm -hmm. care team early on in the course of someone's uh, Parkinson's disease, I think would be the most ideal situation. So yeah. I would, if there was a question about, uh, did I need OT or PT? I would say maybe consider both. I, I agree with you. And it's, it's interesting. I just had a conversation about this uh, with my colleagues here at Spalding in that we were saying we would love for every patient who has PD, P, PD to come in with a PT referral, an OT referral, and a speech therapy referral. And together with our patients determine, is this um, therapy appropriate right now? And if it's not, then we have your, your evaluation and we have your baseline measures, but at least we've established a relationship. We begin to know each other. And if then if sometime in the future, you feel as though you need that service, you can always come back to us. So I, I agree with your answer. And I agree with just what you said. I think that would be the ideal situation for, for that uh, patient, the family and the care team as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, Maura, I, I want to thank you so much for your time today and this excellent and so needed information. I, I think this just gives people so many different ways to look at OT and also um, at just so many resources. Thank so you. I want to thank you so, so much. Um, and I also it's my wanna, pleasure. Oh, I want to mm -hmm. let everyone know that this talk today will be uh, archived and recorded. So if you didn't have a chance to watch the whole thing or um, you know of someone else that might enjoy it, um, this will be saved for us. And then the last thing today, I'd just like to let everyone know, we have another uh, seminar coming up in May. And uh, this uh, will involve uh, Tammy from our office here at BU. And she'll be speaking with Diana and also Sarah, uh, who are a dance instructor and also an exercise physiologist to give uh, other perspectives on different members of a care team to help people with Parkinson's stay active and keep moving. So we wanna thank everyone so much for their time and kind attention today, especially thank you to Maura O'Keefe, occupational therapist, who's just given us so much information today. Thank you so much, and we'll really look forward to seeing you next month in May.